governments are known to frame people. That is standard practice we have seen in security regimes. The greater the security regimes, I mean, this, this gentleman uh, who was the president dictator of Iraq, Saddam Hussein. You know, uh, Mr. Dugul mentioned something right in the beginning. As we got into the information age, we have to forego some of our privacy. And um, I mean, it, it is a fact. If if I was to look at it, you know, you, you have private companies who are spying on what I'm doing. You go to a website looking to book a plane or a you know a bus. You automatically get a message from a you know a tourist agency that this is the bus that you can catch. So their private companies are spying on me, my Facebook account, what I like doing, what I don't like doing. And many would argue that you know, the American argument has been that if you have nothing to hide, then you should have nothing to worry about. And is that fine? I mean, should we just take it par for the course that we are, we're in the middle of this turbulent time, so to say? And uh, if I get spied on, but I get a clean shit, there's no problem. Well, I don't really buy that argument. But what's happening is that okay, you have to give up all expectations of privacy, uh, absolutely. For instance, if you're sending an email, or you're uh, putting something on the social networking site, you're sending an email to a friend or anything, you have to expect that you're writing a postcard whose contents can be read by anyone. You know, like in the postcard, the addressee, the and the contents can be read by anyone. Yeah. Okay. So that has to be your expectation. Also, when you are talking on the phone, you have to uh, be aware that your that anyone can eavesdrop onto your conversations, and not only that, your conversations are being recorded in a digital format, which means they are accessible for years. Then also, you have to see that whatever your patterns or behavior are online or offline. They are all being correlated, and a kind of profile can be built about you, who your yeah. friends are, who your networks are, uh, what your interests are, what organizations you belong to, and that is actually what what is this kind of metadata and profiling that Prism or India Central Monetary System all can do, and that's fairly extensive because businesses have been doing it for years, and now exactly the same thing is being done uh, for the national security purposes, and India already has a lot of these software, the intelligence agencies already have these uh, soft, uh, profiles in place, the profiling software in place as well as the hardware, the interception capabilities as well as the uh, personal, uh, the way to model the person's behavior and his networks and his communications and who his friends uh, are yeah. and then uh, the influencers are. Ajit, I just wanted to bring you in here, you know, this is, this is something that really worries me and scares me at some level also. You know, I, I, I completely accept that information is tapped, information is gathered and at some level I don't have a problem with that but I have a problem with how it's used and uh, something that America did was like what you were saying was create these patterns so if you fit into the pattern you were picked up you were jailed you were questioned and it was basically a system of pre-crime before you commit the crime we we're taking a preemptive strike to stop you from creating sure. the crime based on all these set patterns and with India saying like sir said you know 100% of the population will be monitored is that something we really need to worry about and where do we draw the grey line? I mean, where is the line on this? Well, the good thing and the bad thing is that India, 100% of India does not have access to email, internet, telephones. They don't even have access to food and water. Now we come to talk about national interest, security interest. What is a security interest? Um, uh, my core panelist here has spoken about it, and it's true, businesses do that, you spoke about it. The clear difference between a business snooping on you and the government snooping on you is that the business cannot, at least not easily, frame you. Governments are known to frame people. That is standard practice we have seen in security regimes. The greater the security regimes, I mean, this, this gentleman uh, who was the president dictator of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, he was known to have famously said, he got someone killed, one of his close hands, he said, I'd rather uh, have him killed then be suspicious somebody said he was a friend he says well he was but I wasn't sure so I'd rather have him dead now governments the more power you give to the governments the more they are likely to misuse them to abuse them the question is who decides what is US national security interest and first of all whatever the US government says is the national security interest is it really the national security interest the US government I always ask this please point out one truly democratic endeavor in the world that any US government in the last 200 years has supported. I'm not even saying point me two, I'm saying point me one. Finally, I would like to ask a very simple question. If the prism is such a necessary thing, three of the closest governments and security establishments closest to United States are in Pakistan, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Why has it failed to stop 
the unceasing terror attacks in all these three countries. There is a puppet government in Afghanistan, there's a puppet government in Iraq of Nouri al-Maliki, and the world knows, it's an open secret inside Pakistan, I travel there everywhere, everyone knows inside Pakistan that any government that comes to power in Pakistan cannot come to power with the concurrence and with the OK and with the approval of the United States. They have, with each of these three governments, the United States military and intelligence agencies have the closest of ties. How come they fail to stop all kinds of attacks? Obviously, it doesn't work. This is used only to enhance the agenda of the military industrial complex so that all these big companies, arms companies, they can sell billions and billions of dollars of worth of equipment the world over. The money that should actually go to educating people, to getting rid of them of HIV, AIDS, of malaria, or tuberculosis, which are the real killers in the world. Terrorism is not the biggest killer in the world. This is what Edwards, Edward Snowden has said, that more yeah. people die of road accident in the United States than they die of terrorism. Yeah, that's true. Now, I want to go back to some of what uh, Pavan was saying on the Indian Telegraph, on the um, Information Technology Act. Because uh, from 1885 onwards, uh, telephone tapping and electronic surveillance was governed by Clause 5.2 of the Information Tech of the uh, Indian Telegraph Act of 1885. Now, Clause 5.2 says that in the event of a public emergency or in the interest of public safety, and if there are certain other subordinate criteria, such as the unity of and the unity and integrity of India, sovereignty of the state, defense of India, uh, cognizable offenses, public order, only then can a telephone be tapped. Yeah. Now, what happened is there were a lot of instances of phone tapping right from the 1950s, right from independence onwards, or politicians, uh, powerful politicians. So in the 1990s, the People's Union of Civil Liberty took the matter to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court had uh, detailed hearings. And in fact, the Supreme Court had said that there has to be a public uh, interest, uh, a public emergency or a public safety angle. And the Supreme Court went so far to say that even if the sovereignty and integrity of India was at stake, the, the phones could not be tapped unless there was a public emergency or a public safety. This was codified in the Indian um, Telegraph Rules 419A of 1999. Then what happened is that the Information Technology Act of 2000, which essentially was an act to govern e-commerce, and Section 69 of that just said that the uh, uh, controller or certifying authorities can uh, ask for certain uh, information. In 2008, uh, December 2008, that was modified, and the, they removed the public emergency or public safety criteria and said that any information flowing through a computer or communication resource can be monitor, intercepted, monitored, decrypted in the interest of safety and integrity of India, okay. defense of India and all that. But they left out those two pre, you know, pre uh, necessary clauses of a public emergency or public safety. Those were quietly dropped. And there was also, they inserted another clause, 81, which says that if the Information Technology Act has a conflict with any other act, the Information Technology Act will take precedence and rule over any conflicts. Therefore, they have quietly bypassed the Supreme Court's uh, guidelines which say there has been existing public emergency or a public safety interest. So therefore, the government has got itself un almost unprecedented powers yes. of doing this. Now the question is, even uh, rules of Section 69 were formulated in October 2009, but the government is itself violating its rules all the time. Because even if you look at the kind of uh, numbers of phones being tapped, every uh, authorization is going to be physically signed by the Home Secretary. Yeah. Now there's some like 10,000 uh, tap phones being tapped a day. He can he obviously not sign 10,000 uh, signatures in a day. The government is violating its own rules. Now what's happening with the central monitoring system that India has come up with is that it envisages that 100% when it's fully implemented, 100% of the population of India will have 100% of their communications monitored, whether it's voice, whether uh, communications over a phone, whether it is uh, emails, whether it is SMSs, MMSs, visits to social uh, networking websites such as Twitter or Facebook or uh, YouTube, uh, your web searches, everything will be monitored and collected. Now again, that doesn't appear to have the force of law because the entire, if you look at, again, the wording of Clause 69 of the Information Technology Act, it envisages a particular person to be tapped or a particular premises to be tapped and for reasons to be recorded in writing 
and the home secretary has to certify that the information cannot be obtained by any other reasonable means and that phone tapping or electronic surveillance is really the only feasible means of obtaining this information but again it says a person has to be monitored for a specific reason and that reason you have to say that we suspect this person is such and such a thing or we suspect that people living in this building are doing this activity yeah it doesn't envisage that the entire population is uh, going to be uh, monitored all the time 24 7 365 that that more people yeah. die of road accident in the united states than they die of terrorism yeah that's true uh, and like you had said, we're setting up our own system now. I wanted to bring both of you on the, uh, in on this and just ask you in terms of, this is again something personally I have, uh, I'm concerned about. I don't trust the political system when it comes to the use of information.